Photosynthesis is a type of cellular metabolism utilized by plants. There are two parts to the photosynthetic process, light-dependent and light-independent photosynthesis. During light-dependent photosynthesis, there must be sunlight present. However, during light-independent photosynthesis, it does not matter if there's sunlight, so this could happen during the nighttime. Plants harness the sun's energy, carbon dioxide from the air, and water. Chloroplasts are a type of plastid that is specially found in plants, which allow them to utilize the sun's energy. To capture carbon dioxide from the air, plants utilize a special type of protein called rubisco. Rubisco is extremely prominent and makes up for a large amount of biomass on the planet Earth. This is partially because Rubisco is not very efficient at converting carbon dioxide, so a plant needs a lot of it. Recently, scientists have been able to genetically modify plants to allow them to be more efficient at capturing carbon dioxide and thus producing plant structures. This could increase yields for agricultural products considerably. The products of photosynthesis include glucoses, cellulose, and starches. Glucose is a sugar that is easily utilized by animals. Cellulose is a building block and structural component of plants and starches is a way of storing energy. As you can see, there's a symbiotic relationship between plants and animals. Plants produce oxygen and animals produce carbon dioxide. So let's talk about the cellular respiration of animals. If you take one glucose and six oxygen molecules, and use cellular respiration in an aerobic environment, you will produce six carbon dioxide molecules, six water molecules, as well as a little bit of heat and some energy, which we use in ATP or adenosine triphosphate. The exact number of ATP can vary depending on how efficient the cell is during its metabolism. If there is no oxygen in the environment, also known as anaerobic metabolism or fermentation, then the products are a little bit different. When you are working out, your muscle cells will begin to be in an anaerobic environment. This is going to produce lactic acid. And this is why your muscles are sore after you've worked out strenuously. The lactic acid has built up in the muscles. Another type of anaerobic fermentation occurs in ruminants such as cattle. Ruminants have a specialized stomach that is a host to different microbes such as bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and archaea. When the cow eats a plant-based diet, she cannot consume or digest the cellulose herself. It's actually the bacteria that do the work. As a result of this anaerobic fermentation, they produce volatile fatty acids that the cow can then absorb directly into her bloodstream. The archaea also produce methane, and they are known as methanogens. And so, a lot of times, a cow will burp up methane while she is ruminating or chewing her cud. One of my 
favorite types of anaerobic fermentation is where yeast uses it to produce ethyl alcohol, which humans have been using for centuries as a way to eh, get a little giddy. Hey guys, today I'm here with the Dust Bowl Brewing Company and Don, and we're here to talk about anaerobic fermentation and how yeast is used in the brewing process. Don, a little bit about yourself. How did you get started with beer? Uh, my dad taught me how to home brew about 12 years ago now, probably. Yeah, he got me a, the brewing bug started with home brewing, and then I went through the UC Davis Master Brewers Program and uh, opened up this place with the owner, Brett Tate. How did you first discover that science was involved in the brewing process? When I started home brewing, I, I liked the, the creative aspect of it, being able to build something that I, I enjoy myself, but I'm also very analytical, so I like to, to dive into the science of it, and uh, yeast plays a, a huge part in that. What most people don't realize, the average consumer focuses on the hops and focuses on the malt, but there are thousands of flavor components that come directly from fermentation and the yeast itself. So do you use a specific type of yeast? We use about seven different yeast strains here. There's one main production uh, yeast strain that's uh, Fermentus SO5. Uh, all of the strains are Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but varying varieties for different characteristics. Now, um, I'm sure you've heard of the, the brewing laws related to Germany and how they wanted to make their beer pure. And so they only allowed, what was it, hops, malt, yeah, the, the Reinheitsgebot states water, malt, hops, and then they added yeast after they discovered that it was actually doing something in there. So they, they didn't really know that yeast was an important part, but yeast is floating around all over the place, correct? Correct. So because of that, I see that you have these vats that are completely enclosed. There are wild yeasts out there that are not Saccharomyces cerevisiae and we want to keep those yeasts out because they will impart different flavors and they can, they can take over a brewery depending on that particular yeast strain. In some region that is, that's beneficial, uh, in Belgium there is a, a yeast strain called Britannomyces that uh, has a very unique character to it. Um, some people would describe the aroma as horse blanket. So that that's may, like that. may seem odd to some, but it can be a good part of a beer, but it has a tendency to really take over a brewery if you're, not, if you're not careful with it. And people here in the U.S. have started harnessing that strain and using it for their own purposes. So do you brew more than one type of beer at a time? Oh, we do. Uh, in the vats, we, in the fermenters right now, we have 60% of our production is Hops Wrath IPA, but we also have uh, Russian Imperial Stout, Oktoberfest. Uh, we have seven beers going right now. Now we've looked over and we've seen uh, some of those little pots of bubbling water. Can you explain what's happening there? Sure. Uh, during the fermentation process, the, the yeast take in simple sugars, uh, glucose, maltose, fructose, sucrose, and they're going to break those down and the main byproducts are going to be carbon dioxide and ethanol. That carbon dioxide is going to evolve out, create pressure in the tank, and we put an airlock bubbler at the bottom so we get nothing flowing back in. So kind of keep it sanitary. Correct. And is that yeast, does that also contribute to the bubbling effect that you get from beer? You can harness that carbonation and naturally carbonate if you pressurize the vessel. Because we do a lot of dry hopping, that's where we add hops into the fermenter. Um, that usually blows off a lot of that CO2 and we have to let it come out. But you can cap the tank up and build that pressure. Yeah. Any last words about uh, how science has made your life better? Well, I get to brew and drink beer every day, so that's pretty important to me. <laughs> Excellent. Now, if uh, students want to try some of the science that you've created, where can they find some beer? Uh, if we're, they're 21. Uh, yes, 21, please. <laughs> we're distributed in 20 counties. Uh, Save Mart is a good account. Beverages and more. Costco in the local area here around Turlock carries us. Oh. Or down at the Tap Room, 200 West Main Street. Yep. Excellent. Thank you very much for meeting us. We appreciate it. You're welcome. So, in conclusion, make sure to appreciate how science in, is involved in your everyday life. And if you're 21, head by the Dust Bowl and appreciate it by uh, drinking it up a little bit.